Making the scripture available to all was a means of allowing each believer, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, to directly apprehend God's will. This idea that any individual who was guided by the Spirit would apprehend religious truth could be particularly liberating for women. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this evening's talk. My name is Kristen Motti. I'm an adult programs librarian at the Boston Public Library in Boston, Massachusetts at the Central Library. On behalf of the Boston Public Library, I welcome you to this talk, The Unappreciated Role of Women in the Shaping of Puritanism. This is our first Baxter Lecture of 2020 in commemoration of the 400th anniversary of Plymouth. The Baxter Lectures are dedicated to supporting the mission for educating the public about the founding of immigration and immigration to New England. Now, please join me in welcoming our co-host from the New England Historic Genealogical Society and American Ancestors, Director of Education and Online Programs, Ginevra Morris. Welcome, Ginevra. Thank you, Kristen. I'm honored to be here and to welcome NEHGS members and friends to this program. We are thrilled to be partnering with the Boston Public Library once again. As Kristen mentioned, my name is Ginevra Morse. I'm the Director of Education and Online Programs at American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society. American Ancestors is the oldest and largest nonprofit genealogical society of its kind in the world. We were founded in 1845 and help people of all backgrounds explore their past and understand their family's unique place in history. You can learn more about our resources, experts, education programs, and our eight story research center here in Boston at our award winning website, AmericanAncestors.org. Now, before I introduce our moderator for this evening. I just wanted to mention that the Baxter Lecture Series is actually named for philanthropist and historian James Phineas Baxter, who was also the longest serving president of the New England Historic Genealogical Society from 1901 until his death in 1921. So really the connections between the Boston Public Library and NEHGS have existed for more than 100 years and we're happy to be continuing that partnership through programs like this. It's now my great pleasure to introduce another longtime partner and friend, Donna Curtin, Executive Director of the Pilgrim Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Founded in 1820, the Pilgrim Hall Museum is the nation's oldest continuously operating public museum, housing an unmatched collection of pilgrim possessions that tell the story of ordinary yet determined men and women building lives and homes for themselves and their children in a new world. Dr. Curtin has fostered broader inclusive understandings of the past through her leadership at the museum and through her career in public history, historical interpretation, and historic preservation. She currently serves on the board of Plymouth 400, the organizers of Plymouth's 400th anniversary commemoration. And Dr. Curtin is also the co-curator of the recent exhibition, Path Founders, Women of Plymouth, which aims to reset the 400 year story of Plymouth with a focus on the lives and legacy of path founding women. The exhibit is soon to be available on their website, pilgrimhall.org. So please join me in welcoming Donna Curtin. Thank you so much, Deneva, for that introduction. I'm so pleased to be able to join all of our partners uh, for this program. Uh, I am joining you from the front lobby of Pilgrim Hall Museum in historic downtown Plymouth, and you might be able to see behind me some of the stained glass windows that were given to the museum 100 years ago by the daughters of the founders and patriots of America on the occasion of Plymouth's 300th anniversary, which was commemorated back in 1920. And these windows uh, were given to the museum to honor the history and memory of the women of early Plymouth Colony. So they uh, are uh, perhaps an appropriate backdrop for this program. Uh, it's my honor to introduce our speaker, Francis J. Bremer, Professor Emeritus of Millersville University of Pennsylvania, editor of the Winthrop Papers at the Massachusetts Historical Society and coordinator of New England Beginnings, 
a collaborative partnership uh, of institutions and individuals commemorating the diverse cultures that shaped early New England. Professor Bremer has devoted a lifetime of scholarship to the history of colonial New England. He's authored over a dozen books on Puritanism in the Atlantic world, including most recently, Lay Empowerment and the Development of Puritanism, and the forthcoming One Small Candle, the Plymouth Puritans and the Beginning of English New England, which will be issued by Oxford University Press. His extensive research has revealed the personal experiences and the networks of connection of a multifaceted international religious movement, and he has broadened our understandings of the meanings of Puritanism. His talk tonight is the unappreciated role of women in shaping Puritanism. Welcome, Professor Bremer. Thank you, Donna, and welcome to you all. And let's get started. When one thinks about women in early New England, one thinks about Anne Hutchinson and possibly Mary Dyer. There is no denying the importance of those women and the challenges to the religious establishment that they posed. But today, while I will have something to say about Anne Hutchinson, I want to focus not on these critics of the early Puritan churches, but on the neglected story of women who helped to shape the Puritan movement. Let's start in Rotterdam in 1633. During the previous decades, many English Puritans found it increasingly difficult to square their consciences with obedience to the religious policies advanced by the early Stuart kings. Some had sought refuge in the Netherlands, a land noted for its willingness to accept religious diversity. These included separatists, men and women who severed their ties with the Church of England entirely. Other dissidents were men and women who still hoped that the English National Church might be reformed and who sought positions in English communities in the Netherlands where they had greater freedom to express their beliefs than was the case in England. Some such clergy accepted positions as chaplains to the English forces posted in the Netherlands. Others accepted ministerial posts in, church, in churches that served English merchant communities in that country. In 1611, the municipal authorities of Rotterdam gained permi gave permission for the Scottish and English merchants who conducted business there to hold religious services. Then in 1619, those authorities approved the creation of an English church with a preacher prayed for, paid for by the provincial states of Holland. In 1632, the city donated to the congregation a building, one shoes for the performance of plays on the Glasshaven Quay. The following year, that congregation called you Peter to serve as its pastor. Peter was a clergyman whose career would be in the mainstream of the Puritan movement. He had been active in the reform cause in England, would later move to Massachusetts, where he was pastor of the church in Salem, and then returned to England, where his efforts in the Puritan Revolution would eventually earn him execution as a regicide. While in the Netherlands, he would be briefly joined in the Rotterdam ministry by the distinguished theologian William Ames, and then by John Davenport. According to a contemporary observer, Peter insisted that he would only accept the invitation to the ministry of the Rotterdam Church if he was called by what he called the godly. And so he framed a new covenant to which all must put their hands and none but those that were of that covenant should have any vote to call him. The covenant, the constitution of this new church, was more elaborate than most with 15 articles. The first required that all who were to be admitted to the church, women as well as men, should demonstrate their fitness. The remainder included a statement that the scriptures were to be the congregation's guide, a pledge to labor for growth of knowledge and to that end to confer, pray, hear, and meditate, and to study unity and brotherly love. The congregation having been reformed 
John Forbes, a minister representing the classes of English Puritan churches in the, ne in the Netherlands, conducted the election whereby the church would choose its pastor. Peter having been proposed for this post, Forbes asked those assembled to signify their approval by raising their hands. He then stated, I see the men choose him, but what do the women do? Hereupon an observer reported, the women lift up their hands too. This description is one of the most detailed accounts we have of congregational formation and particularly of how a church officer was selected. But while the detailed account is unusual, how unusual were the events described? Specifically, was it customary for women to vote on these occasions? The account indicates that women did not anticipate that they would have a role in the initial vote, but it also demonstrates that some, including Forbes and Peter, certainly believed that they should be involved. I'm not aware of any other documentation of women voting for church officers, but I am also not aware of any account that shows that women did not vote. Before proceeding, I want to make one more stop in the Netherlands. The English Reformed Church in Amsterdam, like that in Rotterdam, served the local English merchant community. Its pastor in the 1630s was John Paget, who spent much of his time warning his congregation against the democratic threats emanating from the so-called ancient church of Amsterdam, a radical Puritan separatist congregation, which for a brief time had sheltered the pilgrims before they moved on to Leiden. Paget believed strongly in the authority of church elders over the lay members of the congregation. His views led him to block the church's efforts to add Thomas Hooker and then John Davenport to his church ministry. Frustrated by Paget's actions, members of the congregation reacted by petitioning him to make changes in the church governance that would have enhanced the lay role, but not just that of lay men. Women were among the signers of the petition, which among the other changes would have allowed women to vote in ministerial elections. I first came across these stories when researching a biography of John Davenport, and then again when writing a general study of lay empowerment. I initially wrote them off as anomalies, but over time I came to wonder whether they might not have signified a greater role for women, not in challenging the Puritan churches in faith, but in shaping the churches in faith. Might it not be the case that the gender bias of those who preserved records might have colored our understanding of the subject? I'm in the early stages of writing a book on this, but I'm far enough along to suggest that this might have been the case. One can trace a role, a debate rather, over the role of women in Christianity throughout its history. Such an account would include medieval traditions of female piety in England that included women in monastic orders, such as Julian of Norwich, and laywomen, such as Marjorie Kemp. It would also include the Lollard reformer, John Wycliffe, who encouraged an active participation of women in church life. There is evidence of some Lollard women preaching in the early years of the movement. Some opponents even claim that the Lollards considered women capable of the priesthood and of administering the sacrament to believers. An exploration of the entire history of women in Christianity is obviously beyond the scope of this talk. My focus will be on Puritan congregationalism. But before turning to that specific subject, I want to discuss how the broad Protestant emphasis on making the Bible available to all Christians impacted the debate over women's role in the church. Protestants emphasize the importance of reading the Bible for women as well as men. And we have ample evidence that this was taken seriously. Reading the scripture was generally accompanied by study of other religious books. Recently published inventories 
of women who lived in the Plymouth colony in the 17th century contained not only Bibles, but numerous other titles. Making the scripture available to all was a means of allowing each believer, with the assistance of the Holy Spirit, to directly apprehend God's will. This idea that any individual who was guided by the Spirit would apprehend religious truth could be particularly liberating for women. The Puritan clergyman John Dodd attacked Catholics and others who, as he put it, would straightly tie the woman to the wheel and spindle, excluding them from all conference touching the word of God as absurd and unbeseeming to their sex. Those who took this position could draw on St. Paul's statement to the Galatians that asserted the equality of all believers. With this as a broad background, I want to pursue the implications of this for Puritans of various sorts, but particularly for Congregationalists, believers who adopted a participatory form of church governance and rejected the hierarchical polities of Episcopalians and Presbyterians. Various streams of history fed into the development of Congregationalism as it was practiced in New England for much of the 17th century and was promoted by English reformers during the times of the Civil Wars. The underground churches in London and elsewhere during the time of the Marian persecutions of the mid 1550s were largely self-governing groups of laity, women as well as men. The separatist churches formed by the late 16th and early 17th century Puritans who despaired of reforming the national church offered a number of models. The evolving practices of the separatist group that formed itself into a congregation in Scrooby, England, and then after over a decade in the Netherlands, settled in Plymouth, played a particularly important role. At the same time, clergy like Thomas Hooker, Hugh Peter, and John Davenport experimented with similar practices in Dutch congregations that were, if not technically separate from the Church of England, in effect self-governing. At the heart of Congregationalism was a conviction that when Christ, in Matthew chapter 18, stated that if an offender resisted correction, a complaint should be made to the church. The meaning of church was the individual congregation of believers, not a transnational or national institution, nor a regional synod. William Bradshaw asserted in English Puritanism that all ecclesiastical power was held, as he put it, within the limits of one particular congregation. The true confession of the separatist ancient church of Amsterdam, which we have mentioned, stated that congregations be thus distinct and several bodies, every one as a compact city in itself. Such a church was formed by a group of believers coming together to explicitly or implicitly contract together. Those who initially formed the church, as well as those later admitted, were believed to be among the elect, saved by God's grace from damnation. The divine decrees could not be known with certainty, but these men and women were known to lead godly lives, and they offered a profession of faith that in its sincerity enabled the hearers to identify them as fellow saints. An important point is that each church member was admitted on his or her own merits. Women were not admitted because of who their husband or father was, but because of who they were. And it was common for women to outnumber men in congregations, sometimes by as much as two to one. Some church covenants were implicit but many were explicit and recorded in church record books. A good deal of the early churches did not preserve this information, but the records of those that did demonstrate the important role of women. 
the original members of the First Church of Boston included women as well as men. This was also found in the records of the original covenant signers in Dedham and Chelmsford, among other New England churches. The role of women as signatories makes sense when we realize that women played a major role in the formation of many Puritan churches in New England as also in England. Thus, according to a scholar who has studied this matter, when Thomas Taylor reorganized the congregation in Bury St. Edmunds, England in 1653, all members, including women, signed both the New Covenant and the Confession of Faith personally with either name or mark. It should be assumed that this was common practice, although some believers likely did not want to draw attention to it. The church covenant entered into by the believers around Scrooby in about 1605 pledged the members in the fellowship of the gospel to walk in all his ways made known or to be known to them according to their best endeavor, whatsoever it should cost them. For such a covenant to be meaningful, it had to include women as well as men. But this was scandalous to many non-congregationalists. When Henry Jacob formed a new congregation in Southwark, he was strongly criticized for including women without their husbands and servants without their master's consent. If we accept that women were equal members of the congregation, would they not have been allowed to vote for church officers? Again, there's no conclusive evidence one way or the other. I think it would have been a clear violation of congregational principles if women did not vote for church officers, particularly in congregations where they represented a majority of the membership. We've already noted that women were asked to vote for you, Peter, as pastor in Rotterdam in 1633. Similarly, it has been argued that when the Bedford, England congregation chose John Bunyan as their pastor in December 1671, female members must surely have joined their brethren on this occasion. It would be impossible to imagine them not casting their votes at this key meeting. Back to New England, there's an intriguing clue about the possibility of women voting in William Bradford's account of Plymouth Plantation. We know that the Pilgrim congregation allowed extensive participation by women in Leiden and presumably carried that over to New England. In 1623, Governor Bradford responded to an English critic writing, that touching our government, you are mistaken if you think that we admit women and children to have to do with the same, for they are excluded. But where did that charge come from? The most likely answer is that the critic, having heard that women congregants could vote in church matters, assumed that the same privilege existed in the, sing in the civil sphere and therefore leveled his charge. While it is likely that in many churches, women voted for their church officers, it is clear that they were not themselves considered for the principal officers of the church. Though some congregations chose female deacons, often referred to as widows, whose responsibilities included attending to the sick. While not called to lead congregations as pastors or elders, women did speak out in a variety of ways to assert their faith. This was because of the belief that anyone inspired by the Spirit could understand and advance God's will as well as any university-trained clergyman. Thomas Googe, a university-trained clergyman himself, urged his readers to listen, as he put it, to the poorest and meanest Christians and to partake of their counsels, comforts, and experiences not disdaining to learn any good thing from those who in several respects are much thine inferiors. While such statements suggest a role for women, some Puritans explicitly empowered them. 
the pilgrim pastor John Robinson wrote, that one faithful man, yea, or woman either, may as truly and effectively loose and bind both in heaven and earth as all the ministers in the world. Preaching in New England in 1640, John Cotton asserted that God doth sometimes reveal the greatest mysteries of religion, not always to men of eminent parts and gifts, but sometimes to women. And also in 1640, citing the examples of Mary, the brother of Lazarus, and Mary Magdalene, to whom Christ first appeared after the resurrection, Cotton told the Boston church that godly women, being attentive to the ministry of the word, may sometimes understand and be more apprehensive of the mysteries of salvation than the best ministers of the gospel. Among the ways in which women congregants were allowed to participate in the church was by engaging clergymen with questions and comments during or after a preached sermon or during a session focusing on church business. Few such instances of this were recorded, but that is because few church books go into that sort of detail. But James Fisk, noted women participating debates in his Wenham, Massachusetts church, and there are instances of the same type of activity noted by Robert Keane in his notes of Boston church proceedings. A less formal way of participating was in private meetings referred to as conferencing. Early in the Puritan movement, those who were dissatisfied with their parish worship in England, but not yet willing to separate and form their own congregations, frequently met together in private homes to discuss the scriptures, sing psalms, pray, and otherwise promote their spiritual life. Occasionally, as in Scrooby, a conference became a covenanted congregation. But those who felt comfortable in a parish led by a Puritan pastor also found value in such sessions. These gatherings were so useful that they continued as supplements to the life of congregations in New England. The insights of others might help one to, on his or her progress to faith and understanding. Condemned by the English authorities as conventicles, Puritan clergymen encouraged such practices. As John Cotton expressed it, covet society with faithful friends. The benefit is very great. They will be as crutches, and their faith will purchase you inward pardon and outward healing. The Puritan clergyman John Rogers of Dedham, England, stated that society and conference with our fellow brethren may confirm us by their counsels and consolations. Many such conferences on both sides of the Atlantic were mixed gender groups, and in some cases, women played a leading role. In England, the clergyman Oliver Haywood recalled that as a youth, he had been part of a society of some godly Christians that had been joined together by the instigation of an ancient godly woman. Bridget Cook was a married woman of modest means who lived in Kersey, England, not too far from John Winthrop Scroton. She often walked to Dedham and other villages to hear Puritan preachers, but she hosted local saints in her home to read scripture, pray, and discuss sermons they had heard, as well as their relating their own personal religious experiences. In a similar fashion, Anne Hutchinson is believed to have shared her faith and religious inspiration with friends and family in England before she migrated to Massachusetts. Most who commented on this practice accepted that women could teach other women in conferences. More controversial was the question of whether women could speak in mixed gender gatherings and in public settings. Central to the debate were a number of biblical texts which were seen as limiting the role of women in such settings. The most explicit of these was the first epistle to Timothy, 
where it is written, let the woman learn in silence with all subjection. I permit not a woman to teach, neither to usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence. The marginal note to this passage in the Geneva Bible refers the reader to Corinthians, where the writer says, let your women keep silence in the churches, for it is not permitted unto them to speak, but they ought to be subject, as also the law says. Well, that seems pretty clear. But the message of the epistles was not as simple as this. Some who defended the right of women to speak argued that Paul was only addressing the situation in Corinth. Others pointed out that elsewhere in that epistle to the Corinthians, Paul, while asserting that women should have their head covered in church assemblies, clearly implies that they should be there praying and prophesying. John Robinson argued that while Paul may have rejected women speaking in a church as an ordinary practice, he allowed those who were inspired to speak without restraining. Additionally, there are biblical passages cited by Puritans that do describe female speaking on matters of faith. In the book of Joel, that prophet wrote that God would pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and daughters shall prophesy. In the gospel according to Luke, when the infant Jesus was presented in the temple, the elderly woman Anna, described as a prophetess, spoke. In Acts chapter 18, Priscilla, along with her fellow tent maker Aquila, friends of St. Paul, took the recent convert Apollos aside and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Also in Acts, on an occasion when Paul came into Caesarea, he visited Philip the Evangelist, who the text said had four daughters, virgins, which did prophesy. John Robinson was among those who cited the fact that Philip's daughters spoke in the presence of Paul as evidence that in biblical times, the spirit of prophecy kept his course upon their daughters as sons. In the Leiden congregation, Robinson allowed that women, as he expressed it, may make professions of faith or confession of sin, say amen to the church's prayers, sing psalms vocally, accuse a brother of sin, witness an accusation, or defend themselves being accused. He also wrote that when no man would, a woman may reprove the church rather than suffer it to go on in apparent wickedness. Another ordinary and effective way for women to influence their fellow believers was through relating personal spiritual experiences in conferences or public church settings. For a long time, historians categorized the most famous examples of this in America, the confessions recorded by Thomas Shepard, as the equivalent of membership applications. But there's little evidence to suggest that search narratives were required to join a congregation. Indeed, when an English clergyman, William Rathband, questioned the function of these particular statements given in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Shepard's New England colleague, Thomas Weld, characterized them not as admissions tests, but as he put it, meetings of the saints for the holy end of aiding others in their spiritual progress. Sharing experiences was an important way in which believers could help others to find their way to God and deepen the faith of other saints. Hartford Samuel Stone wrote that those who were able should speak of the frame of grace in their hearts as a way of enriching the church and its members. Following the gathering of the New Haven Church, there were regular meetings of members on Tuesday evenings where they discussed and reinforced one another's faith. William Hook, for a time John Davenport's clerical colleague in that church, 
and later a chaplain to Oliver Cromwell, argued that it was a duty incumbent on those saved as touching upon the transmission of the truth to the generation to come. You have heard much, he said, and seen much, and known much, and treasured up experiences, and therefore certainly you should have much to say to such as are of the younger sort. Late in his life, one of the early settlers of New England, Joshua Scottow, recalled how in the early days of the colonies, laymen and laywomen shared their soul experiences, each to other, and found lively characters of the same grace, line for line appearing. Among the relations recorded by Thomas Shepard, 31 were by women. And many of them alluded to how conferences with other women helped steer them to God. The Shepherd experiences were not published at the time, but in England there were numerous such collections of personal stories put into print to help others. John Rogers, the minister of Christ Church Dublin during the English Civil Wars, published numerous relations in Ohel or Beth Shemesh. Many of those relations were by women. Rogers explained the purpose of such accounts was, as he put it, to instruct one another and to strive together, to excel in exhorting, comforting, and teaching to the edifying of one another. And again, to gather out the flowers of their garden to present to the saints in other places. Editing a similar volume of spiritual experiences Vavasor Powell argued that out of those treasures, as he put it, it was possible to bring things new and old for the refreshing, comforting, and supplying of many poor souls, which otherwise had been in extreme want and distress. Reading the accounts, Powell wrote, would help others see not only your own hearts, but many hearts, and heart knowledge is both necessary and precious to sincere souls. Again, over 20 of these accounts were by women. Samuel Petto, another Englishman, compiled a similar collection including female experiences, seeing these as a means by which we may expect the Lord will make successful unto the conversion of sinners, provoking those struggling by showing what progress others have made in the ways of God. The publication of such collections, including women's experiences, was but one way in which female religious views reach print. Some women published their own accounts of their struggles for grace. Female religious writings grew in England in the 1640s and 50s when censorship of the press had collapsed. Female authors included daughters of ministers, but tradeswomen and servants as well. In addition to those who shared their own stories, wrote catechisms and meditations, other women wrote on questions of church polity, on the separation of church and state, on the sacraments, and prophecies on the coming of the end of the world. Given the fact that Puritan women had found ways of expressing themselves in private conferences and some public religious assemblies in the years prior to the outbreak of the English Civil Wars, it was not surprising to find that with the collapse of censorship and regulation, some women in the 1640s began to assume the role of preachers. Thomas Edwards, a strong critic of such practices, wrote of women preachers in our times who keep constant lectures, preaching weekly to many men and women. Numerous tracts identified and for the most part condemned women preachers, including a number in London. A Mrs. Attaway, a lace maker, was one of a group of women who preached in Bell Alley, Coleman Street, on Tuesday afternoons, on some occasions reportedly attracting a crowd of a thousand. An anonymous pamphlet offered a discovery of six women preachers 
including individuals in Kent, Cambridgeshire, and Salisbury, as well as London. With all that I've touched upon as background, I'd like to spend the last portion of this talk going back over the ground of what used to be called the antinomian controversy and is now more properly referred to as the free grace controversy. My intent being to draw that story into a broader account of the role of women in influencing Puritan religion. We think that Anne Hutchinson likely shared her understanding of the scriptures and of her faith with fellow believers in Alford, England, before she migrated with her family to Massachusetts. When she first came to the new Boston, she became aware of various neighborhood conferences where believers came together to discuss sermons and exchange religious views. As described before, such private meetings were an accepted part of the New England scene, and those that existed in Boston when the Hutchinsons arrived were described by Governor John Winthrop as being of use for increase of love and mutual edification. According to her trial testimony, Anne initially did not join any of these, but soon began to host a gathering of five or six to read scriptures and discuss sermons. Cotton Mather later wrote, drawing likely on family traditions, that it was her manner to carry on very pious discourses and so put the neighborhood upon examining their spiritual estates. John Cotton himself initially applauded her e efforts, her emphasis on grace being the free gift of God coincided with what Cotton referred to as the public ministry, his own sermons, which had gone along in the same way. So as these private conferences did well tend to water the seeds publicly sown. Cotton believed that many whose spiritual estates were not so safely laid, yet were hereby helped and awakened to discover their sandy foundations and to seek for better establishment in Christ. Similarly, in his generally hostile account of the controversy, John Winthrop acknowledged the greatest respect she, and Hutchinson, had at first in the heart of all, and her profitable and sober carriage of matters. The growing number of men who attended these meetings, including Governor Henry Vane, the character of the discussions, and some of the ideas advanced by those present became controversial. But the fact of such a conference was not. The appetite for the meetings was such that Anne set up two lecture days in the week, on which occasion they usually met at her house, three score or four score persons. Discussion moved from reviewing the previous Sabbath sermons to controversial areas of theology. Winthrop noted that in a few months, some of the participants outwent their teacher. Over those months, the colony divided, with critics of views expressed by Hutchinson and her supporters being attacked by Thomas Shepard and other clergy, and her supporters increasingly critical of most of the colony's ministers. We don't have time to review the controversy in depth, which can be done in the excellent works of Michael Winship, but there are a few points I would like to make that are relevant to our concerns today. The controversy evidently empowered other women to speak out boldly on religious matters. One instance of this was reported by Edward Johnson, one of the early settlers of Woburn, who on returning from a trip to England was confronted by a group of enthusiasts. One told him of, as he put it, a woman that preached better gospel than any of your black coats who have been at the university. A woman who spoke from the merest motion of the spirit without any study at all, displaying, according to this person who confronted him, more true knowledge than one of your learned scholars 
although they may be fuller of scripture. Shortly thereafter, Johnson met what he called a widow nimble-tongued woman who said she could bring me acquainted with one of her own sex that would show me a way if I could attain it, even revelations full of such ravishing joy I should never have cause to worry for sin as long as I live. Johnson wasn't the only one to be so confronted. The fact that congregants were allowed to speak out in services, to question points and seek clarification, meant that some clergy found, according to Thomas Weld, that after our sermons were ended, you might have seen half a dozen pistols discharged in the face of the preacher. I mean, so many objections made by the opinionist in the open assembly against our doctrine delivered. The second thing that I've been struck with in this controversy is the extent to which the clergy and other colonial leaders engaged Anne Hutchinson herself in debate. In the early days of the controversy, she was invited to a meeting of clergy in John Cotton's house where area ministers discussed her views with her. During her civil trial, the magistrates questioned her and in doing so gave her a platform to express her views. And most significantly, during her church trial, John Davenport, both in private and in the church assembly, treated, sought to persuade her of her various errors. Davenport treated her views seriously, though as erroneous. And on a few points, she conceded that he had helped her to understand things better. This, I might add, is similar to the way in which Davenport later in New Haven engaged Ann Eaton in a debate over the validity of infant baptism. Also, it is more than likely that the women in the Boston church were among those who cast the vote to excommunicate Hutchinson. During the trial, Davenport addressed the issue of who held the right to decide her fate. Scripture gave this power to the church. At issue was what that meant. Now, what is meant by church, Davenport asked. Only the officers or the whole church? Now it is plain, it is the whole church. Now how can the church express themselves, but either by their votes or silence? Supporting the fact that this decision would include the female members, John Cotton, before the vote, decided to say somewhat to the sisters of our own congregation, many of whom have been too much seduced and led aside by her. He sought them to persuade her to approve her excommunication, acknowledging that from her it may be you have received helps in your spiritual states and have been brought from resting upon any duties or works of righteousness of your own. But let not the good you have received from her make you to receive all for good that comes from her. Further evidence of the right of women to vote in such cases came a few years later, when the Boston church sought reconciliation with Hutchinson and those who had followed her to Rhode Island. Anne rejected the new overtures, and the Boston church was then asked to decide whether to cut off her supporters irrevocably. Following the debate over the issue, in which presumably the men were the most engaged, Cotton explicitly asked, I would know how far the wives do consent or dissent from their husbands in this matter. The free grace controversy was not the turning point that some have presented it to be. Expressions of female piety continued after the expulsion of the Hutchinsonians. A synod of regional church representatives convened in Cambridge in 1637 to debate the errors being expressed, address the issue of private religious meetings and the right of congregants to speak out in church. Rather than close down these practices that gave women a voice, the Synod reasserted the general right 
that women might meet, some few together, to pray and edify one another. Though they did identify gatherings where 60 or more did meet with one woman in a prophetical way as disorderly and without rule. Similarly, the Synod acknowledged that a private member, which would include women, might ask a question publicly after sermon, though it was to be done wisely and sparingly. Though not often discussed by historians, there is evidence that these practices did continue over the following years. Let me end with a quick related observation and questions. Thomas Dudley was one of the principal critics of Anne Hutchinson. His children included his daughters, Anne and Sarah. Anne Dudley was born in 1610 and Sarah in 1620. If it is true, which has always been assumed but never proven, that the Hutchinsons traveled to Boston, Lincolnshire, to hear John Cotton preach, it is likely that the Dudleys, members of the Boston congregation, met the Hutchinsons at those services. At any rate, the Dudley daughters, and at the time married to Simon Bradstreet, would have been aware of and engaged with the news of the free grace controversy. They may have attended the civil trial in which their father played a key role, and the church trial, since the family had initially been members of the Boston congregation. I find these circumstances of interest because both of the daughters would subsequently step forward to express their own spirituality and religious views. In Anne Bradstreet's case, this was through her poetry, while her sister Sarah more closely followed in the footsteps of Anne Hutchinson. In 1639, Sarah Dudley married Benjamin Keene, the son of the Boston merchant, Robert Keene. She followed her husband to England in the early 1640s, and there, in the words of Stephen Winthrop, was grown a great preacher. A year following her return to Massachusetts in 1646, Sarah was excommunicated by the Boston church for irregular prophesying in mixed assemblies and refusing to hear in the churches of Christ. Finally, a point and a question. The point, when I pursue this further, I will be sure to explore the end of the Puritan spectrum occupied by Quakers, who took many of the ideas further than others and recognized the importance of women in their faith. And the question, how did Anne Hutchinson and her followers who settled in Rhode Island conduct religious services or meetings? There was no clergyman. Did women, such as Hutchinson and Mary Dyer, preach at those gatherings? We don't know. It's appropriate to end with a question because I'm early in the process of exploring this topic. But I hope I've done enough today to convince you that the question is one worth exploring. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Frank, for that wonderful presentation uh, with so much uh, information embedded uh, even at this pre preliminary stage. Um, we're going to start the discussion part of the program now, and I know we've got quite a few questions from some of the folks attending uh, that we will want to get to, and uh, people um, certainly are encouraged to continue to submit questions to you through the Q&A uh, button on their little panel at the bottom of the screen. But I'd like to start out by uh, asking you uh, a question myself, Frank, and that is, I know that you have been um, looking at the role of women in your work uh, in some ways for quite quite a long time. This isn't uh, necessarily a, a new interest, it, particularly in the, a lot of the biographical uh, publications that you've done. I'm thinking um, in particular of your book, First Founders. Um, and in uh, some of these uh, other works, you talk a little bit about the difficulties of ferreting out these less well-documented uh, experiences uh, of women in the, in the 17th century uh, in particular. And it brought to mind to me Laurel Thatcher Ulrich's uh, work some years ago on the virtuous women of New England. 
these godly pillars of their churches and communities, uh, but women whose contributions were so rarely uh, acknowledged in any way during their lifetime and sometimes were only uh, came to light in the funeral servant sermons that were given at, after their death. And these were the women that Cotton Mather called the hidden ones. So in thinking about more of the sort of the, the bread and butter women of the Puritan movement, as opposed to the uh, more visible and controversial uh, figures like Hutchinson, could you tell us a little bit about how you're contending with the problem of sources? Are you finding new sources? Are you reinvestigating old sources? Are you seeking new ways to interpret this fragmentary record? Good question. Um, it's, it's a little bit of, of all. Uh, I am finding a few new sources, uh, and I'm intending to go much more deeply through some of the early church records that are uh, now available in the Hidden Histories Project of the Congregational Library website. Um, but a lot of it is a question of looking at old sources and asking new questions. Uh, the, one of the uh, sermon notebooks of, of uh, Robert Keene, uh, which I had read through a number of times, um, includes those passages from John Cotton in 1640, talking about how women could be as sensitive and as informed as men. Well, to be honest, I had never paid much attention to those passages. I was asking different questions of that source. And so, yes, going back and, and looking at different sources. Uh, I also would say that one of the things which I've been doing, which I can do from home right now, uh, is going on the online collection of early English books, uh, where virtually all of the 17th century, some are 18th century books, are available online. And you can search the entire corpus. And so, by putting in terms such as women or prophetess or something like this, I'll often be directed to a tract that on the surface has no relevance to what I'm interested in, but buried within it, there are a few passages uh, that help. So it's, 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 it's very exciting. And I, I also hope that at some point I'll actually be able to get into uh, some archives and look at manuscripts that haven't been digitized. Well, we have a, a question, and this may relate to uh, some of the Plymouth Colony research that I know you're uh, going to be working on as well. Um, Jody asks whether or not you've seen any evidence of contributions from women in the Brewster family, uh, referencing the family of Elder William Brewster, who came on the Mayflower. So what was, was there any activity in the Plymouth area that's come to your attention yet? Yeah, nothing that I've seen about uh, the Brewster family. Uh, there are some things, however. There's some indication, for instance, that uh, the wife of Samuel Fuller, who was the physician but also a deacon to the congregation, uh, ran some form of a school and, and taught children uh, during the 1630s. And then one of the things I talked about uh, just a little while ago was the, the practice of conferencing. And we know of at least one conference in Plymouth in the 1630s. Uh, Samuel Gorton, uh, a controversial figure who would later get kicked out of Plymouth, then get kicked out of Rhode Island, then finally get kicked out of Massachusetts, and then come back to New England. Um, when he was in Plymouth, uh, he held a conference which included members of his family and neighbors. And among the people who we know were there, uh, was the wife of Ralph Smith, who had been the clergyman at, at Plymouth, and also a maid in the household of uh, John Rayner, who was then the, the, the clergyman. And according to Gorton, at least, uh, Ralph Smith's wife said that she was how, reported how glad she was that she could come into a family where the spirit was refreshed in the ordinance of God as in former days. So it's, it's a typical conference uh, and it involves men and women. Uh, and that's one. Uh, I'd love to know any information about others that anyone might have. 
Well, we have another um, a similar sort of a regional question uh, from Walter. Um, and he is asking uh, whether or not you have encountered any uh, comparable references to the first disciplinary sermon at Westfield Church. And this is bringing us into the 18th century, 1713, right. when Reverend Edward Taylor hints of full participation of church members, men and women. I'll have to look at that. I, I honestly have not been going into the 18th century yet. And, and one of the reasons for that, and it, I'll be interested to look at it, because in, in many respects, I think that there's a change that occurs in many parts of New England around the middle of the 17th century. And it's a change where you begin to see a shift of authority within the church from the congregants to the clergy. Uh, you begin to get more of a sense of the clergy, not as uh, fellow believers guiding you towards God, but as a professional group that has special authority. And you, you see this uh, in Massachusetts, where around the 1650s, you have laws that basically uh, require churches to choose someone with a university education uh, to be their clergyman. Uh, this uh, is involved in, in the case of the second church wanting to call a lay person Powell to be their clergyman, and, and this, was, this was rejected. Uh, so I think you, you begin to see more uh, of a shift towards clerical authority, and part of that, of course, becomes uh, a change in how women are going to be perceived uh, as congregants. So does this relate to uh, some of the work you're doing, uh, you've done recently on lay empowerment? I mean, you talk about the empowering potential of Puritanism and, and its particular impact on women. Do you see the shift that you're just describing as uh, yeah, affecting and, how, how ordinary people are participating, including women in these congregations? Yes, and I, and I think um, it, it's part of a broader thing, which I also first began to look at when I was dealing with uh, John Davenport, because one of the things that Davenport is very upset with is the growing reliance, not just on clergy within a congregation, but consociations of clergy over a broader area. And I've argued that, that while, yes, Davenport was against the halfway covenant as proposed in the Senate of 1662, his primary concern was the empowerment of uh, church assemblies and the ability of, of groups of clergy to impose their authority over a particular church. And, and as some of the audience will probably be aware, uh, this is one of the issues that becomes involved in the formation of third church, where other churches authorize the secession from First Church Boston in order to form third, uh, which is something that Davenport was not willing to accept. Uh, his congregation would not dismiss those individuals. No one else had a right to let them go. Several of our audience members are, are still probing this, uh, what happens as the 18th century. So I'm just going to give you a, a couple more and then we'll move on to some other topics. But uh, Christopher asked specifically about the continuation of the story in the second generation in later New England and says, some historians suggest that the declensions of Puritan re religiosity actually reduce the space for New England women's uh, uh, voice and power. And uh, what does the evidence tell us? And Susan uh, also has a question that relates, she's looking at uh, the role of women in congregations by the late 1700s. And if there's any other, other denominations um, that allowed uh, their participation, this might be getting to your reference to the Quaker yeah. movement later on. Yeah, no, I think that's right. I think I think people become much more uh, orthodox congregations become much more suspicious of women speaking out, and I think that one of the reasons for that uh, is the Quaker movement uh, and the fact that many of the early Quaker missionaries to New England uh, are going to be women, and they're going to be very outspoken women, and I think that. Uh, what you get on the part of many New Englanders, regular New England Puritans, is a sense that if you allow women to go uh, 
too far, th this is where you end up. You, you, if you encourage them to speak, uh, you get some of this. And of course, the fact that Mary Dyer, who started out as a supporter of Van Hutchinson, herself becomes a Quaker and a Quaker missionary who is hung on Boston Common, uh, is clear evidence for many people that this is where you go. This is what happens if you open this store. Uh, so taking us down another road, Jane asks, in thinking about how women uh, wrote and published in these early times, she's raising the question, how common was it for them to actually be literate? Um, my general sense is that women in Puritan circles in England and women in New England through much of the 17th century at least are as literate as men. Um, the laws that uh, required the education of members of a household specified that it was uh, women as well as men, servants as well as free. Uh, there was a responsibility on the head of the household to make sure that everyone in the household, daughters, sons, servants, was able to read. Uh, and I think the evidence of women who owned Bibles, who owned religious text, and pres presumably they or someone else made annotations in them, uh, speaks to widespread female literacy. And, and, and this is fundamental really not just with Puritans, but with many Protestants, that you, know, you, you, you confront God directly through his word in the scripture. And the only way you do that is to be able to read the Bible. So you have a demand for the Bible in the vernacular, the publication of the Bible, and then teaching people how to read so that they can access it. I believe there was um, a study uh, quite some years ago that indicated that uh, by 1720, there was universal literacy with really no gender gap uh, yeah. in colonial New England, which is pretty astonishing. <laughs> yeah, that would be probably uh, Kenneth Lockridge's uh, literacy in colonial New England. Yeah, and, and it's, I'm not sure if it's as totally universal as he suspects, but yeah, it, it's, uh, it's something that characterized their society. Um, so I'd like to go to um, a, a different top topic, maybe. And uh, uh, I was very intrigued by some of the quotes that you gave of Puritan divines um, who, who really seem to be taking pains to explain women's participation in this 17th century congregational activity. And I uh, absolutely love the John Forbes quote, you know, uh, what do the women do? The women lift up their hands too. It's just uh, so expressive. Um, and while these sources, um, you are reading them as, you know, perhaps uh, an indication of women's uh, very integral role in these early church formations, um, there's a, a disjunction in a way, because in every other respect uh, of ordinary 17th century life, these women's lives were uh, very bounded and constrained by uh, a patriarchal society that uh, placed restrictions, particularly on their speech. So there's this tension there. And I wonder if you could pull that apart a little bit in how you're looking at this topic. Yeah, I think if you're talking about purely about the, the civil sphere, um, women are restrained, although they, they do testify in some court cases. Uh, if you're talking about the economic sphere, uh, their position is, is generally subordinate, although women do inherit businesses from their husband and run those businesses. So you, you have some, op some positions that way. I think that you, you do have uh, some nuance. In England, particularly, you uh, have a lot of clergy who basically say that it's the responsibility of the head of the household to conduct religious services with all the members of the household and to gather them around and pray and sing psalms and instruct them and so forth. But they're also very quick to say that if the head of the household is absent, then the wife 
should take upon herself these responsibilities. We know, for instance, that when John Winthrop was young and his father, Adam Winthrop, was away on legal business or Cambridge University business, uh, that it was John's mother who led the family in these types of activities. Then you move it a little bit further and you have some discussion among the clergy who were participating in the, the Dedham classes, uh, basically a conference of regional clergymen in Essex, who debated the question of, well, should a woman take upon herself this responsibility if in essence she's better than the husband at it? Uh, and they didn't really reach a definitive conclusion because that would have been a very tricky thing to, to say. But I mentioned in the talk that in many congregations, women outnumbered men. And one of the things that, as I've talked about lay empowerment over the last few years, that really struck me is, and I'm going to jump into the 18th century for you here. One of the things that uh, the revivalist Gilbert Tennant used to ask people during the Great Awakening was, would you rather be led, in essence, by someone who has lots of university education, speaks various languages, but has not felt the spirit of God in their soul, or someone who has no education and yet has been inspired by the spirit? Well, and the obvious answer is, well, you'd, you'd like someone who has everything. But if you have to make a choice, and, and this comes back then to our topic, and if a woman is inspired by the spirit, then she has more insight than as Cotton and others said, some educated clergymen. She has more insight than her husband who might not make it into the congregation. Um, and, and I just think this is, this is th this idea that what ultimately matters is the inspiration of the spirit is, is just a terribly liberating thing, which from the very beginning, other people will try to put back in the bottle. That's another story. Um, I wonder if you have seen any finer distinctions of place or personality in, in uh, these evidences that you're reading. And I'm thinking, you know, the, 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 the particular tone and character of these individual congregations. And of course, that individual church formation was so essential uh, to, you know, to these uh, reformed believers, the, as, as you put it, the compact city that each congregation was. Uh, and I'm thinking also of someone like John Robinson in the Separatist congregation in Leiden and how different that experience might have been from some of the uh, congregations formed uh, in the Boston area in New England or even the ancient uh, brethren in Amsterdam. To what extent do you think that opportunities for women to be perhaps full participants in these activities might have been shaped by the individual uh, leadership and character of their congregation? Well, I think by two things. One, by the, the individual leadership of their congregation. And I think one of the things that in terms of Robinson and Plymouth that you look at is that, that Robinson always insisted that we're looking through a glass darkly and there is going to be further light. And so as a result, you know, what we think of now, we might reject in, a, in the future. Uh, and again, I find, I find it interesting to make a comparison with the Quakers because Quakers will not have beliefs, they will have convictions. They will, this is what we believe now. Uh, maybe we will get further light from the inner light in, in, in the future. So I think that's part of it. But I also think that it probably has a lot to do with, with who the women are who are in the congregation. Uh, because you're right in something you said before. I mean, most women were raised in a very patriarchal society. They were not encouraged to speak. Puritanism might give some of them a sense that now they can speak, but at the same time, it, you know, 
that varies from individual to individual. And so a congregation is shaped both by its leadership, but also by its membership, and in this case, its female membership. We have a question here. Oh, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, because I, I think we're getting close to where we have to cut. But I, I, one of the things I wanted to say is that we're not going to get to all the questions presumably today. If anyone wants to send a question uh, to me at Francis, F-R-A-N-C-I-S dot Bremer, B-R-E-M-E-R, at Millersville University, which is M-I-L-L-E-R-S-V-I-L-L-E dot E-D-U, uh, I will do my best to respond to you and answer any questions. I think we might still have time for another question or possibly two. Um, Anne had asked about if women could be deacons, what was the role of an elder? And this is sort of interesting. We were talking a little bit uh, uh, before your, your presentation, Frank, about women's uh, operating as, as deaconesses or, uh, or teachers in some sense. Can you, can you pull those apart for us a little bit? Yeah, um, it gets confusing because when we talk about elders, we, we often talk about ruling elders and teaching elders uh, and lay elders as opposed to clerical elders. Um, most Puritan congregations tried to have two, were, were basically clerical elders, a, a pastor and a teacher, uh, who both shared the preaching ministry. Uh, theoretically, the pastor was to offer counseling advice in his sermons, and the teacher was to explicate doctrine, but they mix those back and forth. Then you had basically governing elders uh, who were to supervise the congregation. Uh, that would include deacon. William Brewster was one of the governing elders of, of the Plymouth congregation. Women as deacons, the, they more often, and I believe it's in the Cambridge platform, the term used is, is ancient widow. Uh, but they're sort of serving as deacons. I mean, a deacon is also supposed to collect money, supposed to help uh, deal with the sick and the, those in need in the congregation. I haven't found a lot of evidence that congregations choose ancient widows or, or female deacons for anything. I mean, that's one of the th things that I'm going to have to look at uh, more closely. Well, I think we have time for one more question, Frank. And um, Gina asks, uh, what books and articles you would recommend to learn more about this topic, which I think is something that probably many of our listeners would be interested in hearing. Oh, boy. Um, <laughs> well, I, I, you know, to be uh, egotistical, uh, my book, Lay Empowerment in the Development of Puritanism, does deal with some of this in a more preliminary way. As far as with women, uh, there are good books on women in Puritanism by Amanda Porterfield. I, I'm not sure the exact title of that. Uh, on the English side, um, Antonia Frazier, a number of years ago, uh, wrote a book called The Week of Vessel, uh, which is very good on the general situation of women uh, throughout English society in the, the early modern period, uh, and which I would recommend. I've been going back through it recently. Yeah. Um, I might also add, you know, that perhaps uh, uh, some years uh, older now, but Laurel Thatcher, Ulrich's works, of course, yes. uh, you know, I think are just primary for, for people to still be familiar with both yeah. Good Wives well, and The Midwife's Tale. And, uh, a lot the of that tends to be earlier. Um, but I, I actually, I should also mention, and you'll uh, notice, um, Michelle Kafkin's uh, recent book on Penelope Winslow would be something that people might be interested in looking at because this is a prominent Plymouth woman. And published by the Pilgrim Society and Pilgrim Hall Museum and available on our website. So thank you for that, <laughs> Frank. I think, uh, thank you so much for this discussion. Uh, uh, it was really a great pleasure to have a chance to chat with you about this new work you're doing. Thank you, Frank. I enjoyed it. Thank you, everyone.
I also want to say on behalf of American Ancestors and New England Historic Genealogical Society, of course, I want to thank you, Frank, for your fantastic lecture. You know, every time I hear you speak, I learn something new and unexpected about early American history. So thank you. And thank you, Donna, for your expert moderating and shepherding the many questions from our listeners. Um, thank you to Kristen and the Boston Public Library for your continued partnership. And of course, thank you to all of our members. Uh, the NEHGS members and maybe not yet members uh, who attended this program. I do hope to see many of you at our online programs and hopefully our research center in Boston very soon. Thank you, Ginevra. Thank you, Frank. Thank you, thank you, Donna, very much for that very interesting conversation and for sharing your expertise with us this evening. Thank you to WGBH Forum Network for producing tonight's talk. On behalf of the Boston Public Library and all of our partners here tonight, thank you very much and have a good night.